Commitment 2014 from Channel 8 WMTW, Maine's Total Weather and News, a debate in the race for governor. Good evening and thank you for joining us for WMTW News 8's gubernatorial debate. This is the final debate before Election Day, which is two weeks from today. I'm WMTW News 8 political reporter Paul Merrill. I'll be moderating tonight's discussion. I also want to introduce two people from our partner news organizations for this debate. First of all, Dana Bash is CNN's chief congressional correspondent. She's an award-winning journalist who breaks news from both campaign trails and Capitol Hill. And Rob Poindexter is the Central Maine Bureau Chief for WABI TV5 in Bangor. He covers state politics in Augusta. We are, of course, also joined by the three men who want to be your governor for the next four years. We have Independent Elliot Cutler, Republican Governor Paul LePage, and Democratic Congressman Mike Mishu. Thank you, gentlemen, all three of you, for being here tonight. We're looking forward to a good discussion. There is no studio audience for our debate, but I do want to welcome our audience from around Maine, both in the Portland market and in the Bangor market, and anybody watching us online. First, a word about the format of the debate. Each candidate will be allowed a one-minute opening statement. There will be no closing statements. Each candidate will be allowed one minute for a response to each question. Follow-ups and rebuttals will be allowed at my discretion. We decided to stick with alphabetical order for this, and that means that, Elliot Cutler, you begin with the first opening statement. Thank you, Paul. Measured against our New England neighbors, the Maine economy has declined now for 11 straight years through eight years of a Democrat and now almost four years of a Republican. I don't have the, all the answers. No one does. But I do have some new ideas and a real strategic plan for Maine. The one thing I know for sure is that we can't keep doing the same things and expect different results. My opponents are trapped in a political system that's not working. It's been hijacked by special interest PACs that don't care one whit about you, your kids, or the state of Maine. All these PACs care about is whether the next governor of Maine has a D or an R after his name. Their millions will guarantee only more fighting and more gridlock. One of these PACs is going to begin running negative ads against me this weekend. Why? Because I'm offering something different. I'm offering hope to George, a welder, who will lose his job when the Verso Mill closes. I'm offering a chance to stay in her home to Betty, a woman in Bridgeton who will lose her home if taxes keep rising. I ask for your vote. Thank you, Mr. Cutler. Next opening statement, Governor LePage. Well, thank you for this, this uh, final debate. It's a great night. Uh, you know, we all love this great state, and I particularly am very fond of it because this great state's been much, much better to me than most. I have been very, very fortunate to make it off the streets of Lewiston never thinking I'd ever become the governor of our great state. I have lived the American dream. And I think that every man, woman, and child in this state deserves an opportunity to carve out their piece of the American dream. I believe Maine's at a crossroads. We can continue with 40 years of liberal rhetoric and policies that clearly didn't work. But we can continue on what we've started of reforming welfare, reducing red tape, cleaning up the structural gap, paying off our debts, and finally getting the fiscal house of Maine in order. Thank you, Governor. Next opening statement, Congressman Mike Mishu. Thank you, Paul. The voters have a very important decision to make on November 4th. Right now, you have a choice between two very different visions and leadership style here in the state of Maine. We can, you can either choose the divisive partisan nature over the last four years, or you can vote for someone who has a, a new path forward, a path that will bring people together to, for what's best for the people here in the state of Maine. I learned early on that leadership is not about pounding your fist on a table to get things done, moving the way you want to, or pretending that you're the smartest person in the room. Leadership is about being able to bring people together, to find a common ground where we can move forward. That's what I've done. I've listened to the people here in the state of Maine, and I hold your values very dear to me. And that's what I'll do as governor as well. The debates may be over this evening, but the conversation with voters will not be for me. Over the next two weeks, I'll be traveling throughout the state of Maine, and I want to listen to your views of how we can move Maine forward in the future. Although I may not visit with each and every one of you, I will ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you, all three. 
Our first question tonight will begin with Governor LePage. It has to do with jobs in Maine's economic recovery. Back in January 2011, Maine had lost 28,000 jobs to the recession. Since then, only 18,300 jobs have come back, leaving us almost 10,000 jobs short of our pre-recession high. Also, Maine's economy has traditionally relied on the logging, paper, and shipbuilding industries. But over time, we've seen jobs erode from these industries, especially the paper mills. The latest blow came earlier this month when we got news that more than 500 Verso mill workers in Bucksport will be losing their jobs at the beginning of December. So our question is, what is the best path forward for these industries and Maine's economy? We begin with you, Governor LePage. Well, the, the two things that happened to the, to the industries in Maine. Number one is regulations got so bad that the what I call the tier one companies just threw their hands up, left the state of Maine. Now we're left with older technologies, with second tier companies that don't have the same capitalization. We have uh, an energy crisis in New England, which I've been working on for four years, and unfortunately, my opponent voted not to expedite natural gas. The Democrats keep voting for windmills and solar panels, which the windmills in the country right now that have uh, invested in windmills are facing anywhere from a 10 to a 50 percent increase in in revenues. The jobs that we've had, I believe, is is up around 22,000. We have another 8,500 jobs that are unfilled right now, and we're working, and we're going to continue to move forward, and we're going to beat the 2011 record. Thank you, Governor. Congressman Michaud, the best way to move forward in the economy. The economy, first of all, you got to understand about the economy. And, Governor, last night you said that someone making $100,000 a year is not a lot of money. Well, tell that to a logger in Jackman or in Fort Kent who's barely getting by who making $32,000 a year with no health insurance. Governor, you've struggled, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, but clearly you've forgotten where you came from. As governor, I'll be putting forward a progressive uh, program that will build upon Maine's strengths. Small businesses, 97% of the businesses in Maine are small businesses. If they grew at the national average, that's 31,000 jobs over a 10-year time frame. Uh, making Maine the food basket for New England. Clean renewable energy, that's the economic growth area that's been uh, designated by the Maine Technology Institute that, with good high-paying jobs. My plan, and my May May plan, is a plan that's realistic, a plan that we can reach, a plan that costs $35 million. So I'll be moving forward with a, something that we, is a reachable goal here in the state of Maine. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Cutler. Prosperity in the 21st century is not going to be an accident. It's not going to be a coincidence. I want to talk about your kids. The governor said there are 8,500 unfilled jobs right now in the state of Maine. And you know what? Your kids, if they're trained and educated, healthy, and ready to go to work, can help fill those jobs. People who are on welfare and aren't working, if they get the right education and the right training, can fill those jobs. Our problem right now in Maine is that we're not educating a workforce that's going to be ready to take on the challenges of the 21st century. Sure, we need to fix the regulatory structure in Maine, and I've suggested that we put in place the Office of the Grim Repealer, three people who will sit and look at all of Maine's rules and regulations and get rid of those that aren't working so that we don't get in the way of Maine businesses that are expanding and growing. But they all need a healthy, young, trained, and educated workforce. Thank you. Now, we have one specific follow-up question for each candidate. The first one will begin with Congressman Mishu. We've heard you talk a lot over the years about the New Balance Shoe Factory in Norwich Walk. Our question for you is, what other business or businesses have you helped bring to or keep in Maine? Yep. Uh, actually, during the, the BRAC uh, base closure, uh, when they put the DFAS facility in, in limestone uh, on the closure list. Uh, that uh, was a big disappointment for the Maine congressional delegation, but I told my staff that it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity not only to fight to keep it open, but to grow uh, the DFAS facility. We fought very hard to do that, and the good news is the chairman of the BRAC commission at the time 
was, is, uh, was uh, Anthony Principi, the former secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs, with which I've had a very good working relationship with over my years in Congress. Not only were we able to keep the DFAS facility open, we actually doubled the size of the workforce at DFAS in, in Limestone from 300 to over 600 jobs. Those are good paying jobs in the part of the state that really needs that economic growth in that area. All right, thank you. Our question for Mr. Cutler. Mr. Cutler, you've suggested raising Maine's sales tax either year round or during the peak tourist season. You've said you're not concerned that doing so would scare tourists away from Maine, but wouldn't either option discourage business growth? No, I don't think it would, Paul. You know, in Maine right now, we have, for example, an 8% meals and lodging tax. It's 9% in Vermont and 9% in New Hampshire. I haven't seen a single car stop and turn around at the Kittery Portsmouth Bridge because they didn't want to come to a state with a lower meals and lodging tax. If we don't do something about shifting the tax burden off our seniors, off farmers, off fishermen who are paying property taxes that are going through the roof, if we don't do something about that and put the responsibility back on a broader tax base, we're not going to be able to grow the state's economy. What I've suggested is one of two things. We can eat, we're going to, first of all, we're going to cut main property taxes for median homeowners by 20 to 40 percent. That's going to save the owner of a $160,000 home here in Lewiston $875 a year in property taxes. In exchange, we're going to do a half percent increase in the sales tax or a seasonal increase in the sales tax so that tourists who visit here every year, 15 million of them, will have a chance to help us take care of this great state. If I could just follow up, forget about tourists turning away at the border. What about businesses who may want to invest in Maine? You're adding to the tax burden of the state. You're adding to the tax burden of people who are consuming, Paul. And everyone, most of us, agree that taxes on consumption are a lot better for growing an economy than taxes on savings. The problem we have right now is that Mr. Michaud has proposed $320 million in new spending, whether it's in year one or two or three or four, and hasn't told us how he's going to pay for it. He talks about a progressive tax, a progressive growth tax. I don't know of a tax that's not, that is a growth tax. Let's do the question for Governor LePage, and then we'll give the Congressman a chance to rebut. Governor LePage, you've campaigned on a promise to make Maine open for business. Have you made the state more business friendly in your time as governor? What specific results have you seen? Okay, yes, I believe we have. We've cut back a lot of red tape. What we haven't done is we haven't removed regulations. We've just changed the attitude in, in, in the state of Maine by getting an answer to the people much quicker. An example, when Carbonite came to Maine, they called us on April 2nd. By April 29th, they were licensed, permitted, and ready to hire people. Since just in the last 12 days, companies that have come to Maine, uh, Lincoln Logs to Burnham, Jodel, Jodel from the Nordic countries are moving their entire operation to Maine. Pioneer Plastic in Auburn moving 140 jobs, closing their plant in South Carolina. St. Croix Tissue, two tissue machines at a $120 million investment. Irving Sawmill, another $35 million investment. And I can go on, there's several more, including Jackson Lab and Central Maine Coal Storage. Thank you, Governor. Congressman Michaud, if we can quickly follow up. Mr. Cutler's hit you several times in these debates about the spending in your plan, $300 plus million. You said you've pr you would prioritize the budget. I haven't heard you answer how you would specifically raise the, any of that money. Yep. Uh, my plan, first of all, cost uh, $35 million. The bulk of the plan is the $15 million for making the sophomore year of uh, college uh, uh, tuition free. Uh, budget's about priorities. And I've negotiated several budgets during my tenure in the Maine legislature when I was president of the Maine Senate as chair of the Appropriation Committee. And I made it very clear, we're not going to get to my priorities all on day one. It's going to take time to get there. But budgets are priorities. And as governor, I'll be submitting a balanced budget to the legislature uh, like Governor LePage has. Governor LePage's priorities was the tax cuts for the wealthiest of Mainers, which the bulk of them went into effect outside of the budget cycle. I know how to write budgets. I've done it uh, uh, many a times here in, in the legislature when I was uh, chair of the Appropriation Committee. I think Mr. Cutler wants to no, interject. Every governor has to submit a balanced budget. Right. That's a fact. But here's how Mr. Michaud's $320 million adds up. 
He wants, whether it's in year one or year four, he wants to do 55% state funding for public education. That's $188 million. He wants guaranteed uh, tuition, college and university tuition, $6 million. Restore full municipal revenue sharing, $80 million. We can go on and on. It adds to $320 million, and part of that is a $35 million main made plan. He hasn't told us how he's going to pay for it. I've suggested he's going to propose some kind of tax, and he's keeping it a secret. Okay, we're going to move on now. We're going to go over, we've been getting a lot of social media questions leading up to this debate, including during this debate, from viewers submitting questions on social media, email, and the live wire that's running on WMTW.com. WABI's Central Maine Bureau Chief Rob Poindexter is monitoring those, and he has our first social media question. Rob. Thanks, Paul. With Maine's aging population, seniors will have a big impact on the election. Kara Korchesny says that many older, low-income Mainers living on fixed incomes go without basic necessities. Her question, how would you structure your administration to maximize efforts to address the housing, transportation, and home care needs of Maine's older adults? First response, Mr. Cutler. Kara, this is exactly why I propose the property tax relief plan for the state of Maine. We're going to reduce property taxes by 20 to 40 percent for all median homeowners in the state of Maine. As I said earlier, a $160,000 valuation on a home in Lewiston will yield $875 a year in savings. And as the woman in Bridgeton, whom I mentioned in my opening remarks, said to me when I ran into her at the Freiburg Fair and she took our calculator and figured out how much money she was going to save, she looked at it and she exclaimed, wow, I, this means I can stay in my own home. That's the way we're going to help. Governor LePage. Well, basically, that's one of the reasons why I've been fighting not to expand uh, Medicaid expansion because of the uh, $100 million a year it costs the state. I think that money is better spent, and the state has been subsidizing nursing homes, the disability, folks with disability. We've got waiting lists and the mentally, the mentally ill. I believe very strongly that we have made a commitment and we need to hold that commitment to our elderly. They have paid their taxes their whole lives. Now it's time we do a couple of things. One, all income tax on pensions should be removed. I attempted to do that. The Democrats defeated it. We need to take a look at our military uh, veterans. They're leaving our state and going to other states because their pensions are taxed. Many of those are young people that we want back in Maine. And we need to commit ourselves to taking care of the mentally ill in our nursing homes and certainly those who need services at home that aren't getting it on the waiting list. Thank you. Congressman. Yep. Uh, I think when you look at our uh, senior citizens here, here in the state of Maine, I'm, first of all, I'm very pleased to receive the endorsement of the Maine uh, uh, or the National Council to Protect and Preserve Social Security and Medicare because of my 100% voting record over my lifetime in Congress for senior citizens. Uh, and we have to do what we can to make sure that seniors actually can age in place. And part of that <clears throat> means we have to build out a, an infrastructure. When you look at one of the concerns in a rural state like Maine, uh, taking care of the seniors in their home is telehealth. We've got to build the broadband infrastructure here so seniors will be able to stay at home. And unlike what the governor had done, when you look at the, the, the rides uh, for individuals to be able to get rides to their, their hospital care, uh, you know, we need to take care of that. Uh, meals on Wheels is a very good program. The governor tried to cut the Meals on Wheels program. The governor also tried to uh, cut the prescription drugs uh, uh, for our elderly. We've got to make it easier for our seniors to stay in place. Part of that is uh, property tax. Uh, the governor eliminated in one of his budgets uh, the municipal revenue share. We don't need any new complex program to help municipal property tax owners. We just got to fund the programs that are currently out there, such as municipal revenue sharing, education uh, funding, the circuit breaker program, which we did in the legislature as well Thank as you, the Congressman. Homestead. I'm going to let Governor LePage respond before we move on. I've, I've listened to all his rhetoric for, for about several months now. I'm tired of it. This man doesn't know what honesty is, and that's all I can tell you. Congressman? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, it's unfortunate uh, the governor uh, feels that way, but the bottom line is the governor says that uh, he, people might not like the way he says things. He just says it the way it is. 
what the governor says is anything, whether it's factual or not. And I have a proven track record of fighting for, for seniors, and that's why I got the endorsement from the main council, I mean, the, the National Council to Preserve Social Security and Medicare. Okay. Governor? Now I have to respond. Okay. This is the gentleman that while I was on a trade mission to China, who came and said that I believe Social Security and Medicare was welfare. Folks, I will tell you, I have paid 47 years into the system. I believe the system. The only problem with the system, it, it is the federal government that runs it, which is a sad day. I believe that Social Security is a contract between the employer and the employee. I believe Medicaid is Medicare, something we paid in, which this man voted to take $716 billion to cover ACA. I'd just like to point out that that cut is actually also in Republicans' budget proposals, the $760 billion. That yeah. was also Paul Ryan's budget. It's not really a, a cut, in my understanding. I, I don't know, but I know that I didn't vote for it. Okay. May I? Well, we have to move on. Sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, Paul, yes. uh, first of all, I mean, since the governor talked about the comment I made while he was in China about uh, he, he, him not making Social Security and Medicare, they didn't say it was welfare. Governor, I have your, your press release right here. Well, you said Social Security, Medicare is welfare, plain and simple, regardless what the liberal said. It's your own press release in, in black and that, right. Sir. So, excuse me. I, I, yes. The argument about who says what is much less important than figuring out how we're going to govern Maine in the future, so that we know how we're going to pay for everything that Mr. Michaud just said he wants to do. He said it again, and how we can avoid cutting everything that Mr. LePage has cut in the past and will continue to cut. Okay. That is Maine's we're challenge. We're going to move on, Mr. Cutler. Thank you. Uh, our next question, we're going to go to more individual candidate questions. They're going to come from CNN's chief congressional correspondent, Dana Bash. Dana? Uh, Governor LePage, first back to your economic policies. You tout your tax cuts here in Maine, but the economy really is still lagging. Not only has Forbes ranked this state dead last when it comes to businesses, it's second to last in growth prospects and the bottom 10 for economic climate. How can you say your tax cuts are working, sir? Governor. Well, what we did in the tax cuts, uh, contrary to what people like to say, is we cut the lowest tax bracket in the state for 70,000 people that were on welfare. And we cut that, and we let them keep that money. We are encouraging to work to them to work with us on our welfare to work program, which I think our welfare to work program is showing promise. We've been at it now for six months. 900 people in the state have joined the program. 250 people are currently getting training. 150 people have already gotten jobs, and 800 companies have now joined the program. So, I. My tax uh, breaks would have worked much better had we had a legislature that would understand the energy crisis that New England is facing. Next individual question, Dana. Thank you. And for Congressman Michaud, a question about your job in Washington. The Veterans Affairs Department has seen major crises this year. We've seen cookbooks, vets dying while they wait for treatment. You are the top Democrat on the House Veterans Affairs Committee. You're in charge of over overseeing the VA, uh, and yet you don't accept any responsibility for these problems. Why not? Yep. Well, actually, it was because of the Committee on Veterans Affairs with Chairman uh, Jeff Miller and myself, because of our oversight hearings that we've been able to have, and they've been very aggressive oversight hearings, that we were able to actually bring this to fruition. Uh, the bottom line was that whistleblower came out that actually helped us when they heard what we were going through and gave us some documented information on how we can see where the, actually the VA was. Uh, cooking the books. Uh, and we actually acted aggressively. One of the things that the chairman and I made very clear, we were not going to use veterans as political pawns. It had been very easy for the Republicans to blame the Democrats for what the scandal was all about. Very easy for the Democrats to blame the Republicans because it started under George Bush. But we didn't do that. We focused on our hearings. We subpoenaed the department, employees from the department, and there were my motions to subpoena the department, and we moved forward. I'm very pleased with all the stuff we've been able to do on veterans. And in Maine, we're very fortunate, unlike Phoenix, Arizona, some of the other facilities, 
And part of that is because where I am ranking member of the Veterans Affairs Committee, veterans in Maine let me know what's going on at Togus, and we were able to work things out here in Maine, and we finally put the state, uh, the country on Thank a you. good path uh, for taking care of our veterans. Thank you, Congressman. Yeah. And Mr. Cutler, as an independent candidate, you are dramatically affecting the dynamics in this race. There's been a lot of talk here in Maine and nationally, I can tell you, about the bromance <laughs> that you are having uh, potentially with, uh, with the Governor LePage. The fact is, the reality is, he believes that the better off you are, the better you do, the better he does uh, on Election Day. Is he using you as a political pawn, sir? You know, Donna, I can't speak for Governor LePage. I would not suggest, and I think he would agree, that we don't have a bromance. <laughs> I'll tell you this. I agree. I'll, t <laughs> I'll tell you this. Uh, the, the, the fact is that all of my support, growing support, is coming from an equal distribution of Democrats and Republicans and independents across the state of Maine. These are people who want to turn away from fear and want to vote for hopes and dreams. They want a positive future for the state of Maine. Four years ago, four years ago, because voters in Maine voted strategically, because they wanted to try to maintain a position that one or the other of the three candidates shouldn't be elected, because of that, we ended up with Paul LePage as governor. We shouldn't make that mistake again. If people in Maine will vote for the person whom they think will be the best governor, there won't be any question whatsoever about a bromance or about missing another chance. Governor, I'm going to let you weigh in, but you have told me that Mr. Cutler's campaign is one of the best things for yours. It, it, it's certainly an early Christmas present from the standpoint that he was here four years ago and we know what to expect. But I will tell you, four years ago, we had Libby Mitchell running. This time we have Mike Michaud running. This, if it was Mike Michaud against Paula Page, the election's over. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, We're going <laughs> <laughs> to. I want to have a new chain for this chainsaw. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on to a question about education. Uh, and for this, we're going to start with Congressman Misha. The question is 10 years ago, voters approved a measure that required the state to fund education at 55%. We've already talked a little bit about this, but in 10 years, it's never happened. So tell us specifically how you will make that work. Thank you very much for that uh, very important question. Uh, as you know, Paul, I have a sister, who, Lynn, who uh, teaches education. She's a t teacher, and she uh, really loves her job. And every weekend uh, when she's back in her home or whatever, she's working, you know, for the, you know, getting their plan f for the following week. Teachers work very hard. And as a state, the state has to live up to its commitment as well. I've always said education is an investment. It's an investment in our future. And as governor of the state of Maine, I made it very clear that it's my goal to move towards the 55%. I know we're not going to get there overnight, but we have to start making that effort to get there. Uh, the other area for pre-education, uh, funding, er, the more funds you put up front, study after study has shown the better results that you'll have a at the end. And that's uh, what I'm going to do as governor, focus on education. It's also important for our economic development. As I talk to CEOs and site selectors from all around the country, what they tell me is they need a workforce, a workforce that's educated. And if they do not have the tools uh, to, for that workforce, at least be able to retool that workforce. Congressman, we are going to move on, but I have not heard you say specifically where, would, where you would begin to find the money to pay for education. As I mentioned earlier, uh, budget's about priorities, and the governor found uh, his priority uh, for doing those tax cuts for the wealthy. My main made plan is $35 million a year. We have it spelled out where the money's going uh, to, and, and I will have a balanced budget. I'll be smitten to the legislature, and we'll be eliminate some of the programs that the governor had put into place. Thank you. Mr. Cutler, 55 percent. I'd be happy to yield my time if you want to try to answer the question, Mike. I mean, <laughs> the fact is, the fact, let me, the fact is that what Mike just talked about is another 200 million in spending, 188 million, more than that, 188 million for 55 percent, and 30 million or so for early childhood education, universal or early childhood education for three and four year olds. That's a lot of money. I have proposed doing it, and I've proposed how we pay for it. And everyone in the state of Maine who wants a governor who's going to be a good governor ought to ask Mr. Michaud where's the money coming from because a lot of it is going to come out of your pockets. Governor? Well, it, the way I look at it is very simply this. 55% is never going to be achieved because of the way we passed the referendum. 55% is des designed by the administrators of the schools. 
So you never get there. It's not a fair playing field. It's not like you sit down and you establish it. But this is how I think you can improve education. I think you've got to weaken the union, which my opponent is married to. And secondly, we've got to get more money into the classroom. Right now, there are two winners and two losers in the education system. We have administrators and the union winners, the teacher and the student are major losers. Congressman, just before we move on to the next question, uh, can you uh, name a specific uh, way you would pay for education uh, funding? Uh, where the governor's uh, you know, misrepresenting uh, my view on uh, the 55 percent, I never said we're going to get there overnight. I said that's my goal is to move there. How it's will, not, it's how not going to happen overnight. How will we start? Uh, well, we'll start by actually investing the $35 million that's very targeted towards getting our economy moving again. That's how we're going to get all this rut that we're in. And where, is, does, that is, money is, come, where does that it, money come it, from? It, within the budgetary process. It's only $35 million. I know it's a lot of money, but it's only $35 million a year. Year. And as the governor knows, budgets are priorities, and I will find that $35 million within the current budget cycle. Governor, quickly. Yeah, quickly. Uh, every year, the budget, the demands from the school is going to be about $80 million. We've been putting roughly $80 million a year into the budget. I think how you do it is you focus more, reduce the administration size of our uh, school district. We only have 185,000 kids. You get second career professionals who want to teach. You get let them in as adjuncts, and most importantly, you find the best teachers and you pay them better. Thank you. We're going to move on. We're going to stay with education, though. Our next question comes from a Rumford native who is a senior at USM. I'm Megan Bourgeois. I'm a political science student at the University of Southern Maine. Decline in state support for higher education is forcing a lot of students to take on huge amount of debts or to leave the state in search of education or employment. So what would you do, if anything, to stop that brain drain? Do you believe that right now it's a priority to invest in college-age citizens? Mr. Cutler, the higher ed question begins with you. Megan, good question, and thanks for pursuing your education. First of all, I proposed years ago and still believe that we ought to merge the two systems, the community colleges and the universities. We have seven campuses in our university system, seven campuses in our community college system. We have two CEOs. We have two boards of trustees. We have two purchasing departments. We got two of everything. It's like Noah's Ark. We will save money and produce a better system if we merge the two systems. Secondly, we've got to contain our costs throughout the entire system because education, higher education costs in Maine are rising faster than health care costs. And third, I want to tear the barriers to, po to post-secondary education, to post-high school education. I want to tear those barriers down for Maine kids. I propose a program called Pay It Forward, Pay It Back that increased enrollment in higher education in Australia by 50 percent. We can do that in Maine, and it'll make it possible for high school seniors, graduating seniors, to go to college, to go to training, to go to, to, go to the universities without paying tuition. Thank you, Mr. Cutler. Governor LePage. Yeah, I'm working on, we're working actually on three programs right now. This year, we had, had a pilot program in 2011 for Kent High School. It was resoundingly successful, where 24 kids were taken randomly, sent into the university, finished their junior, senior year, and up to a year and a half, and a minimum of a semester of college. That's one program. This year, there's 250 people in it. The other thing we're doing is we're working on a scholarship program, particularly for those kids that are going to enter in the areas of STEM, because that's one of the weaknesses. And I do agree that uh, with uh, candidate Cutler that we do have a weakness in that area. And the other thing that we're going to do is we're going to bring the private sector in. And the third program is to sell student loans to employers and give them a tax credit as long as that student works with that employer for a number of years. Congressman, higher ed. Thank you very much, uh, Megan, for that, uh, for that question. I understand what you're going through. Uh, my sister had, you know, still has uh, college uh, you know, tuition that she's paying for. Uh, when you look at what's happening in higher education, the state's uh, funding has been stagnant for a number of years. Enrollment in the university system ha has declined. The uh, community college has a, a different uh, situation. Uh, and what my plan is, and it's the half of my $35 million actually focuses on uh, education for higher ed. 
$15 million is set aside to make the sophomore year tuition free. And the reason why the sophomore year tuition free, that is the year that uh, college students usually drop out because they do not have the funding to continue the, their education. The other thing I'll be doing is working with the president of uh, the Maine Community College as well as the chancellor of the university system to get the two systems to really work together to find ways where they can collaborate more and really, uh, you know, with efficiencies in, in trying to streamline uh, the process in, in both the uh, higher ed facilities. Governor, well, thank you for your question. Yeah, just very, very quickly, uh, one thing I, I failed to mention is through the new chancellor, Jim Page, he's made a commitment that for the first time in my lifetime, the university system and the community college system are going to have a credit transferability program for everyone. So we're not going to extend okay. their time. Thank you, Governor. Um, our next question begins with you, Governor LePage, and uh, there's been a big debate here in Maine about whether to accept federal money to expand Medicaid called Maine Care here in Maine uh, to tens of thousands of Mainers who are capable of working. Uh, you've blocked the expansion effort five times. Our question comes from one of the Mainers who was affected. Yeah. My name is Gail McLean. I own and operate Thread of the Mill Farm in Gray. I was one of the 70,000 people taken off Maine Care in December of 2013. There was a provision in the Affordable Care Act to cover people such as myself living under the poverty level under Medicaid expansion. My question is, why hasn't that been accepted in this state to cover people like me? Governor, very, very simply this. There are, there are, there's a pool of roughly 70,000 people. I do agree there are people under the federal poverty level, and there are two ways to address that. One is get them out of the poverty level, or secondly, find a program that deals with them specifically. Where I had a problem is we were paying for people up to 400 percent of the federal poverty level, and they need to be able to go to the exchanges. The this, this federal exchange will allow anyone from 100 percent on up to qualify up to 400 percent to qualify for large subsidies and so I think that we need to address that maximize that aspect of it take those that do not qualify and then find a way to get them insurance some of those health care options are maybe affordable but there are deductibles on there that they would say are unaffordable to somebody making so little money <laughs> That's ACA. I didn't put that in because our program. Well, I'm talking private health care options too. Yeah, well, that, that's ACA. That's what I'm saying. The Affordable Care Act has changed the entire system. For instance, the state of Maine employees, we have to either pay a large penalty beginning in 2018 of millions of dollars, or we need to take some benefits away because the federal government classifies it as a Cadillac program. So we have to try to work within the system. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Congressman Mishu, what do you say to people who agree with the governor and say, I shouldn't have to pay for these people who are capable of working for their health insurance? Yep. Uh, well, that's, that's a great uh, question, Gail. Uh, thank you very much. And I made it very clear. On day one, I'll be submitting legislation to the legislature that will cover the 70,000 Mainers who are denied access under the Affordable Care Act, and of which 3,000 are veterans, not only because that's the morally right thing to do, but it's, the state will save over $600 million over a 10-year time frame by covering those 70,000 Mainers. Uh, hospitals get a $348 million over that same time frame. It's estimated that there will be about 3,000 jobs created by that. And over a 10-year time frame, the state will be able to receive uh, $3 billion. Now, the governor keeps talking about that they can go on to the federal exchange. Well, that federal exchange is the same exchange that was under the Affordable Care Act. And once again, this governor not only has not expen uh, accepted the legislature bipartisan bill, uh, as far as the expansion of health care, but he's also refused to establish an own exchange here in the state of Maine. The states who establish their exchanges, what we're finding out, is actually the cost of health care in those states are uh, starting to go down. And this governor has refused to do to ex uh, accept either. I'm going to let Mr. Cutler answer first. You've said you would expand Medicaid. Why? Paul, let's keep this simple. I don't know if anybody out there can understand the disagreements that Mr. LePage and Mr. Michaud are having. Let's, let's go back to, the, to square one. Every single person in the state of Maine, every man, woman, and child ought to have, needs to have access to primary and secondary preventive care. They need a medical home because if they get sick, it costs all of us money, number one. So yes, we should expand Medicaid and we should accept the federal funds. Secondly. 
the hospitals want us to do this why because they're now going back into the red they're heading right back into the red we need a health care system plan in maine that will help the hospitals and that will make certain that every single person in maine can get the health care where they live when they need it and as much of it as they need to stay healthy and and to stay alive we need a healthy trained and educated workforce in maine we need new ideas to do it and we need to start planning right now thank you mr Cutler. i do want to move on we have a lot of questions only 20 minutes left back to cnn's dana bash dana well, you're speaking about the health care system here. The big topic on a national level and certainly here in Maine is Ebola. And so the question is, do you think that Maine is prepared to handle an Ebola outbreak should it happen here, especially since the top two positions in the state's infectious disease unit are actually vacant? Congressman Michaud, I'll start with you. Uh, thank you very much. That's a very uh, great, it's a great question. And any contagious outbreak such as Ebola is a, a, cost, a concern, a real concern. And I have a very, uh, I'm very concerned here in the state of Maine of what's happening here in the state. The governor says that the state is prepared, and you hit the nail right on the head. When you look at the two top positions in infectious diseases here in the state of Maine, this governor has left those positions vacant. And we have to fill those positions immediately. We cannot rely on the U.S. CDC to tell us exactly what's happening. And the governor has failed us He's, uh, as far as keeping those uh, positions uh, vacant. It's a security issue, a health care issue. Thank you, Congressman. Same question, Mr. Cutler. I agree with Mr. Michaud that the governor needs to fill those positions quickly. It's difficult for the person who's running CDC and is fighting a court battle against a whistleblower to also act as the state epidemiologist, which is what's happening right now. I understand that's a problem. Let's get those positions filled. But beyond that, beyond that, let's go back to the whole question of public health in the state of Maine. We need in Maine a robust, active public health system. We need an effort to make sure that people get vaccinated when they need to be vaccinated, that they have access to medical care when they need it, that we are putting investments where it's needed in order to maintain that kind of a system, that we have a better medical transportation system in Maine than we now have. We need to build that capability. This is a huge challenge in a state that is aging just about as fast as any other state in America and already is older demographically than any other state. This really deserves our attention. Thank you. Governor LePage. I totally disagree with both of them, and I do not want, as your governor, I, I'm not going to be irresponsible and scare the main people. The CDC, MEMA, work every single day. We have been working with hospitals every single day. We are in constant communication. I am assured by the doctors and by the professionals at the hospitals that we are as prepared as anyone can be. Whenever we, we, we've had two episodes of scares with the bowler, they were both fortunately false, but the protocols were followed. I'm understanding that they were perfect. I mean, they were as people expected. They reacted the way people were expected. They were tested, and then the scares went away. All right. Our next question has to do with welfare. We're going to begin with Mr. Cutler. When we say welfare, we're going to define it. We're talking about the following public benefits. Temporary assistance for needy families or TANF benefits, SNAP or food stamp benefits, WIC and housing assistance. The question is, what is the best way to transition people in Maine from welfare to work, Mr. Cutler? You know, for a lot of people who are on welfare, and let's not talk for the moment about people who are abusing the system. Most people on welfare, most people on public assistance really want to work. They want a job. But too many of them don't have the education or the training they need to get a job. So number one, we ought to make getting an education, getting a, a GED, an equivalent uh, high school diploma, uh, getting training, we ought to make that a requirement for people who are on welfare. We ought to incentivize it by making sure that they get more of an earned income tax credit if they do get educated and trained. Secondly, we've got to get rid of the cliff effect. The cliff effect is what keeps so many people on welfare when it makes more sense for them to stay on welfare instead of making less money going to work. We ought to wean them off welfare. There ought to be a bridge from welfare to work and not a cliff. And finally, we need to make sure that people who are abusing the system 
aren't able to do that. And I've proposed using smart EBT cards with embedded chips that keep people from using their benefits to buy things like tobacco and alcohol, bail and lottery Thank tickets. You, Mr. Cutler. Governor LePage, welfare to work. It's exactly as Mr. Cutler uh, described since he's had five years to prepare the, to answer the question. We have proposed the cliff program my first year and the Democratic legislature balked at it. They blocked it. And, and I will admit, some weak-kneed Republicans followed suit. We tried it again in 2013, same thing. We wanted the tiered system to wean people off welfare at the same token. But what we've done now, we've come up with a new program. In the last six months, we have the Department of Labor, Department of Education, DHHS, as I mentioned earlier. They're working every person that comes in for an intake for welfare. We sit down, we assess their educational skills, and if there need be, we send them into the education system. Those that are ready to take on jobs that are available, we put them into the jobs. We have caseworkers that follow up on them and work with them. We are addressing welfare, and I will say this. I know what it takes to get out of welfare. It's education and a good job. Congressman, welfare to work. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I support the earned income tax credit as well as the tiered system to get people out of poverty in, in, into the job. The governor ran his first campaign on that and uh, he's failed to deliver. And there's no excuse. The Republicans controlled the House and the Senate for his first two years in office, and the governor should have passed that to his first two years of office, but he failed to show his, his leadership. Uh, as far as waste, fraud, and abuse and mismanagement, I will, under a Michigan administration, we will not allow what this governor has allowed for waste, fraud, and abuse and mismanagement. The fact that when you look at Riverview, the, the, that's $20 million the state's going to have to pay back. The CDC shredding of the documents, uh, it's up upheaval over at CDC, and that's why I have a concern when you look at the whole Ebola issue. And when you look at, uh, you know, the Alexander report, the governor went to hire, spent a million dollars, that was his priority in his budget, for, for the Alexander report, which it was nothing but to plagiarize or, or uh, the report to justify the governor not accepting the expansion under the Affordable Care Act. Thank you, Congressman. Governor, quickly. I was just going to say this about shredding. My first day as governor, January 5th, 2011, I walked in the governor's office, there was a shredder, and the bag was full. That's what you get from a Democratic governor. Yeah, quickly, quickly, quickly. If you take the decline over 11 years in the main economy, step by step, year by year, for 11 straight years, and turn it upside down, that's the increase in welfare dependency. Democrats share it with Republicans. It's no one else's fault. Thank you, Mr. Carlin. We're going to go back to Rob Poindexter. We've been getting a lot of response from viewers. Rob has a question from social media. Thanks, Paul. What constitutes wealthy in Maine was at the center of a dust-up between you gentlemen last night. Governor LePage, last night you said someone making $100,000 a year is, quote, not that rich. This question comes from Mary Austin, who wants to know, what do each of the candidates consider to be a living wage? Governor LePage, we begin with you. I think $20 an hour is a living wage in the state of Maine, because we are indexed. While our, ta our property taxes are high, I do agree with that. Uh, but we are cost of living is high, and I agree with that. Our energy costs are very, very high, and I agree with that. Those are all things we should be able to fix. What it takes is a legislature who's got the stomach to do what's right for Maine people instead of what's, do, what's right at the ballot box. Congressman, what's a living wage in Maine? A, the, a living wage is about fifty or sixty thousand uh, dollars. That's a, a good. good uh, a wage uh, should be higher than that. Uh, actually, I'm not sure whether or not we'll be able to get there. The fact that the governor said last night that $100,000 is uh, not a lot of money, it is a lot of money. Uh, you look at the loggers in uh, Fort Kent or, or Jackman, uh, the governor uh, you know, doesn't understand what hardworking men and women are going through here uh, in, in the state of Maine. We have to, uh, he actually even vetoed the minimum wage. There's no one who's uh, working full-time on the minimum wage should be living in poverty. You look at a study that was, I mean, earlier this year, 13 states uh, increased the minimum wage. And in those states, they actually saw a job growth, where other states who have not increased the minimum wage 
uh, uh, you know, they have not seen that job growth. And the governor vetoed the minimum wage bill that was passed in the Maine legislature. Quickly, Governor, you want to respond? And was the $100,000 comment off mark? I don't think it's off mark. I don't think it's, it's wealthy. I really don't. Now, I, I will say that $50,000 is half as much as 100000 but I defy anybody to tell me if you're making hundred thousand dollars and you got two kids going to college and you want to try to give them a good start in life that that's a lot of money now the point I wanted to make about a minimum wage very simple right now 750 an hour 40 hours is 300 bucks if you go to nine dollars but ACA requires allows employers to drop their work week to 30 hours only 270 thank you governor we're out of time Mr. Cutler. If the minimum wage had kept pace with what it was in 1968, today it would be $10.95 an hour. If it had kept pace with the rising incomes of the top 1% of American wage earners, it would be $22.50 an hour. Now, the fact is that raising the minimum wage to $9 or $10 is important, but it's not going to be enough to get you to $50,000 a year. We absolutely need to start fixing Maine's economy for the 21st century. I have a plan to do that, a strategy. Neither of my opponents do. That's the way we're going to raise incomes and opportunities in the state of Maine for you and your kids. What's a livable wage, dollar amount? 50 is a good number. 50,000. And, and you don't get there, Paul. You don't get there at 9 or even $10 an hour. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go back to CNN's Dana Bash for another question. Thanks, Congressman Micho. You have changed your position on social issues, uh, for example, abortion. This is a day and age when voters really crave authenticity. So, what do you say to those who see that and say, you know, maybe he's a political chameleon and he's not a principled politician? Well, thank you very much for that very uh, important uh, question. But you got to understand, when I first ran for the Maine legislature, I was 24 years old at the time, living in a uh, rural part of the state of Maine, a Franco-American family. Back then, it was jobs, the economy, and the environment that really motivated me to move forward. And yes, I have changed uh, over time in, in the, as a member of Congress. Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, is when I had an opportunity to talk to women uh, about their very personal stories that they have told me, uh, you know, really is heartfelt. And I listen to them, like I listen to everyone. And I have changed. The fact. Uh, I've been endorsed by NARAL, uh, Planned Parenthood. Uh, my, uh, over the last several Congresses, I had a 100% voting record w with NARAL and a 92% uh, voting record over the lifetime of uh, Congress uh, with, with Planned Parenthood. And there's nothing wrong with a politician changing their mind uh, over time. We have all evolved here in the state of Maine, whether it's a uh, woman's right to choose or whether it's LGBT issues. And that's a good thing that we can change. Thank you, Congressman. Mr. Cutler, you are an independent running at a time when people are more disgusted than ever before with partisan politics. Given that and the fact that voters here know you, you've run before, why aren't you doing better in this race? You know, Donna, the, the record in Maine of successful independent candidacies, and we've had out of the last uh, 10 governor's races, the last 40 years, we've had now nine contests with multiple candidates. Of those nine, independents have won three of them and almost a fourth. And in virtually every case, except the re-election of Angus King, the race broke in the last two weeks. Uh, that's when, that's when independents start gaining. It's when I did last, last uh, four years ago. I don't expect this time to be any different, except that I expect to win. Uh, this is a fascinating, fluid race. Most Maine voters remain undecided about which way they're going to go. I'm asking them to vote for Maine's future. And governor LePage, you are not even done with your first term as governor here, but you have vetoed more legislation than any governor in Maine's history, 181 bills. Uh, isn't it your responsibility, though, to work as a leader with the legislature to make sure that you can find compromise so you get bills you can actually sign and not just veto it? Because I come from Washington, and this almost feels more paralyzed than Washington. Well. I will say this, that out of all the bills that have passed, 180 bills is roughly 18% of the bills. So that says that 82% or over 80% have got through. Out of the 80% of the bills that got through, two-thirds of them, or nearly two-thirds, were sponsored by Democrats. So the issue to me is this. 
I will say, unlike, you know, my opponent to my right has been a Democrat, a Republican, an Independent, back to a Republican, back to a Democrat. I don't know. I've lost track. Mike Michaud has been bought and paid for by unions. I, on the other hand, look at every bill. I read every bill. I study every bill. I go to my staff to look at every bill, and I veto bad bills. If they're good, I'll compromise. If they're bad, such as I will eradicate hunger in Maine by December 31, 2014, with existing resources. Thank you, Governor. We have a lot of questions coming in from social media. We want to go to one of those now. Uh, Cindy S. says, I would love to hear each candidate speak to a few good things that each candidate has proposed. I'm tired of this slamming. Uh, we're going to keep these responses to 30 seconds to move quickly. And I believe we begin with Mr. Cutler for this one. Oh, I think that the work uh, Congressman Michaud has done for New Balance, uh, I hope it turns out well, and I hope New Balance gets the orders. He's worked hard at that. Uh, and Governor LePage has worked hard at uh, reforming welfare. And I do think that he, he knows what it takes to get out of welfare because he did it and he got an education. Governor LePage? Yeah, I, uh, I, there's two or three things I'm very proud of. One is uh, bucking the system and uh, taking surplus monies, matching it with federal dollars and giving it to the nursing homes to keep them alive. We did lose two in July but we prevented from losing two more in August. Then domestic violence, I think the work we're doing in domestic violence, while it's not complete, it's making some headway. But co comments about your opponents. My opponents? Yeah. I don't know, I don't follow them. <laughs> Congressman Mishu, a few kind words about the other two gentlemen. Uh, uh, well, well, I understand having served in the Maine legislature on the chair of the Appropriation Committee and uh, as uh, president of the Maine Senate and the evenly divided Senate, how difficult it is to put together a budget. Uh, uh, it's not an easy task because you have to weigh priorities and you have to have a balanced budget before the legislature. So uh, I, I respect the governor's uh, ability to uh, get his priorities I into the budget process, such as uh, you know eliminating municipal revenue sharing to pay for his tax cuts. I mean that was uh, uh, you know he he w was great at that. Uh, and Mr. Cutler, I agree with the uh, expanding access to health care under the Affordable Care Act. Good so. things. <laughs> We're going to go to our last question. We're running out of time. 30 seconds each for this final question. Uh, it's the last question of the last debate, and it is, if elected, what is the biggest difference that Mainers will see five years from today? Uh, I believe we be begin with Governor LePage for this. There are two things that prevents Maine from being a top competitive state. And, I've, and it was told to me by the chairman of Airbus. He asked me two questions. Governor, are you a right-to-work state? No. Governor, how's your energy cost? I was very smart. I said, we're the cheapest in New England. He said, can you beat Alabama? No. So the fact of the matter is we need to address Maine's competitiveness. Congressman Michaud, if elected five years from today, what's the biggest difference we'll see? I think we'll see the biggest uh, difference is the attitude uh, in not only in elected officials from Republicans and Democrats, but also the general public as far as working together. What we need is a governor who believes in the state of Maine, a governor who has a positive image about the state of Maine, about our workforce, and if you're in poverty to help you lift you out of poverty. Uh, it's my goal to make Maine the food basket for New England. I feel very comfortable that we'll be able to do that. Clean renewable energy, those are the sector jobs that pay good wages uh, under my leadership of getting our dependency off home heating oil by 50 percent by the year 2030. We're, we're going to get there uh, eventually and I look forward to that. One minute left on I'll the debate, you, 30 I'll seconds. I'll tell Mr. you what Cutler. you'll see. You'll see more jobs. You'll see a growing economy. You'll see a state ready for the 21st century. This election is your chance to choose between more of the same and a really bright new future. This is your chance to turn away from your fears and vote for your hopes and dreams, and that's why I'm asking for your vote. Gentlemen, Elliot Cutler, Governor LePage, Congressman Michaud, thank you for joining us tonight. We also want to thank our viewers at home. We want to thank Dana Bash from CNN and Rob Poindexter from WABI-TV. Again, gentlemen, thank you for agreeing to run for public office. Thank you for the spirited discussion. Feel free to all high five each other. Uh, if, if anybody at home wants to continue watching, you can stick around online on our live wire. We have full analysis of this debate. We'll have full coverage tonight at 11. Thank you sincerely for watching this debate and please go vote November 4th.